Welcome back to ABA with Dr. D. This is Dr. D. I'm real happy to have you all uh, once again here. Today we're going to talk about a really uh, interesting topic, which is about reinforcers. If you work in the field of behavior analysis, reinforcers are obviously essential. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about preference assessments, and one particular preference assessment that we're going to focus on will be multiple stimulus with replacement. Okay. Um, and that's basically one of the one of the, the the types of preference assessment methods that are you know commonly used in our field. So we'll get into it. Uh, but before we, we start talking about you know this particular preference assessment, let's take a little review and and, and let's remind ourselves what reinforcers are and and what they mean. Okay, so unconditioned reinforcers are aka primary or unlearned reinforcers, and they function as reinforcers due to hereditary or evolution. Okay, and they do not require any learning history to become reinforcers. And some examples of these particular reinforcers may be food, water, oxygen, warmth, sexual stimulation, human touch. Okay, so all these are, once again, unconditional reinforcers, things that do not require any kind of learning history. They are just reinforcers just by us existing. You know, these are things that are necessary for us to exist, in other words, okay? Now, the other, um, you know, basically side of the coin is the conditioned reinforcers, which is here it's about the, you know, secondary or learned reinforcers. And everything that relates to conditional reinforcers starts with the neutral stimuli, right? Something that does not have prior history of reinforcement. So how does this particular stimuli or neutral stimuli become a reinforcer? It's through a process of, you know, pairing, okay? So that's what the second bullet point says here. It says neutral stimuli that begin to function as reinforcers as a result of being paired with other reinforcers, either conditioned or unconditioned. And can also uh, condition reinforcers through verbal analog conditioning. And some examples can be, for example, yellow paper, stickers, and for us that we work in the field of autism, uh, tokens, right? Token economies are a very common type of condition reinforcers that are used in our field. Okay. Um, and then we move on to generalized condition reinforcers. So generalized condition reinforcers is basically a type of condition reinforcer that has been paired with many condition and unconditioned reinforcers. And uh, they do not depend on a specific EO to be effective. Basically, these reinforcers get you so many things. And that's why one of the examples here is actually money, right? The one in the middle of money is such a big reinforcer because you can get so many things with money, not just one particular item. Okay. So once again, this is what con uh, generalized condition reinforcer is. Okay. So when you're running, uh, when you're looking at reinforcers, you can have edibles reinforcers such as food, sensory reinforcers, massage tickles, tangible reinforcers, um, activity reinforcers, and social reinforcers such as uh, physical proximity and social interaction. Once again, all of these items right here, maybe the physical part, for example, is social praise, might not mean much for, for a student at first. So that's why the whole aspect of conditioning and building that rapport with the student is so essential to establish these particular um, you know, activities as reinforcers. Now, there are two basically strategies to use in tandem when you're identifying reinforcers. You can use a stimulus preference assessment or reinforcer assessment. We're gonna focus on the stimulus preference assessment side of it, okay? Um, with regards to the, here it says caveats to regarding preference and reinforcer assessment. So preference obviously changes over time. And that's why you need to be always looking out for what kind of reinforcers the student is interested in that moment, okay? Um, that tends to be a big mistake, by the way. I see a lot of, a lot of people working in the field that want to utilize only this, you know, the same reinforcer or item over and over again, and that could lose value, okay? Uh, the preference assessments do not identify the reinforcing effect of stimuli, okay? So things to consider. Um, we're going to focus obviously based on, on a trial base, you know, type of method here. Once again, the general procedure is present select the stimuli to children in a series of trials. We measure the approach such as eye gaze, hand reach, the contact, did they touch or hold the item and their engagement. Did, did they interact with that stimulus? Um, can categorize as high, medium and low. So we want to know like, once again, we're going to create a scenario where we're presenting a variety of different items and you want to see are these items, you know, consider high, medium or low in regards to like the, 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 the preference for the, for the individual in that moment. And there's many variations obviously for the procedure. Okay. Um, we're not going to get too much into this. These are, we will have other videos that will talk about, you know, for example, the single stimulus. Okay. We're going to later on talk also about the pair stimuli presentation, which is when you present two items. Uh, but the one that we will talk about is the multiple stimulus. Okay, so here basically it's an extension of the pair stimuli presentation. And here you're presenting an array of three or more stimuli together. Okay, once again, the category is three or more. If it's two or less, you know, or two, or, uh, basically that falls within the paired uh, stimuli. And then one will be the single. Okay, 
So there's two major variations here. Once again, we're gonna focus on replacement. So stimulus select that remains in array in subsequent trials, okay? With our replacements, the other type, which is basically when selected stimulus is removed from the array in subsequent trials, and it takes about half the time to complete the procedure, and it is still fairly accurate, okay? So a lot of people do prefer the stim uh, without replacement, okay? So let's talk about the stimulus, uh, the multiple stimulus with, once again, re replacement. Um, so here is basically, you know, number one, you're going to sit across the child at a table or on the floor. You're going to place three or four items in a straight line within the child's reach in order to, uh, by a signed letter. If the child is unable to wait onto your task direction to make a selection, block the view of the item with a large book or clipboard. Number three, lift the book or clipboard if you are blocking the child's view and give the task direction, pick one or which one do you want, okay? Number four, if the child reaches for more than one item, block access to both items and repeat the task direction. Pick one or pick one for now. We'll pick another one next. If the child continues to make this error across several trials, you should consider conducting a single stimulus preference assessment or free uh, observation. Number five is allow the child to consume the edible or play with the toy and block access to the remaining stimuli during this interim. While the child is consuming the edible item or playing with the toy, replace the unselected items with new items and choose a new location for the chosen item in the array. So you're gonna move the item that was picked to a different uh, part of the, you know, the, the items that are gonna be presented. This will allow you to detect that the child's only choosing from one side, which once again is another error that sometimes people make is keeping the item in one particular side, okay? Those are some of the, those are the steps basically to running this particular type of parental assessment. There's a couple more steps here. If you are using toys, put the chosen toy back in the array after 15 to 30 seconds. If you're using edibles, replace the chosen edible with an identical edible in the array. Thus, for every trial, you will have the same number of items as the previous trial, and the array will always include the most recently selected item. Number eight, repeat steps four through seven until, until the set number of trials is complete. So for example, after every item has been presented at least twice or until the child refuses to make any further selections. So that would be your criteria to know that you're ready to move on, okay? Uh, once again, the guidelines for selecting and using a stimulus preference assessments, so you wanna monitor the target person's activities prior to assessment to be aware of the EOs that may affect results. You also wanna balance the cost benefits of procedures, so time to do it versus level of confidence also. Uh, some of these procedures may take a long time, specifically the one that we're looking at right now. Also, balance ranking versus no rankings, which shifts a preference. And with, when time is limited, use fewer stimuli in the race, so use less items, okay? When possible, combine data for multiple assessment procedures, okay? So I'm not gonna get into this. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna watch the video together. Uh, we have an, a video model of, of how to run an MSW. Uh, we'll look at it together and, and we'll talk about it some more. All right, so here goes the video. Okay, so before I start, uh, you know, letting the, view, the the video play real quick. So the instruction is pick one. You already see that I have a data sheet there available. Uh, here the student picks uh, the item in the middle, which is the guitar. Okay, so the next trial should be where the child, um, we, where the instructor the or the individual running the trials um, is going to keep that guitar in that next trial. So let's see if I did the good job with that. Let's figure it Let's see the next trial. Remember that when they pick an item, for example, like um, their non-edible items, you can allow the individual to interact with the item. Um, you know, I, I like to do 30 seconds or so to keep the item, you know, in the child's hands, okay? Or until the child gives you the item back. That can also be another good way to do it. So here I go, I'm already filling out my data sheet there. Okay, so I said my turn to get the item back. You use other prompts there if you want to. So I move the item to another location. The guitar is moved to another location, but the guitar is still in the field. So I, uh, I deliver the pick one instruction. Child picks penguin now. Okay, so now I'm documenting that in my data sheet. Okay, very, very straightforward there in regards to that aspect of maintaining that data collection process there. So I say my turn, so I get the penguin back. I replace a couple more items there in the field size or in the location. Okay. Okay, excellent, so now he changes the item. It's this really cool looking um, 
the toy he can play with. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, the whole aspect of data collection is so important here, uh, you know, for, for you guys that, that are running this, these trials. Um, it, it, it is it is very critical for you to maintain that, okay? So here you go. Item back. Let's move to the left side now, okay? Okay. okay so now he picks a little Lego there. That's gonna be in the next one. So you, I think you guys all get the idea now that how, how this particular procedure you know, works how this method works. Um, you know, definitely, in, in, like is mentioned in the in the lecture side of the of this particular um, training model, is that if the child it tries to grab all the items all at once, then maybe it might not be the right procedure to use. Okay, so I said my turn. Okay, all right. So there we go on the left side now. Okay, perfect. So bring the item a little closer to the student. All right, he looks for the penguin. So. There it is. Okay. Now, rule of thumb for people, they're asking like, oh, how many trials do I have to run? Um, well, you have to run, uh, people like to say, well, uh, you know, try to present each item two times, maybe. That can be a criteria. Um, also, at some point you're gonna figure out, okay, this particular item gets picked over and over again. So at that point you can already, you know, document that as being the, the most preferred item in that moment, okay? So leave that to your criteria. Okay, so you went for the little ducky now. Okay. All right, so he seems to be enjoying this uh, little ducky there. Okay, my turn. Okay. All right, he goes for the car. All right, so yeah, this is once again a, a procedure that it does require time. Um, I'm not gonna lie, it is something, a procedure that does require a bit more time than the others. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I know that some of you guys are going to school and, and getting this experience, this exposure to a variety of preference assessment methods. It's, this is once again, this is how, how it looks. You're to run it. Okay, see, so he goes for that little item there. Yeah, it seems like, Kind of like two times that I think that he picked the same item there. So I think for now it looks like Penguin and in that particular toy, uh, this one that he has on his hand seem to be like the most highly preferred ones. So we'll see, we'll see what he picks next. Okay, so what I'm doing right now in that situation, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my data sheet to see what the next items that need to be presented. So I try to keep that, that or you know, that process going, so. I gave all the items a fair chance to be presented at the same amount of times. Okay, so the item, once it gets placed there. All right, he goes for the car. Cool. Ooh, he drops his car. <laughs> okay, but once again, this particular student is, this, this model, this method works well. This student is compliant, there's no problem behaviors. He's pretty focused, um, and like I said, just a matter of keeping that going. Oh, that guitar gets picked again there. I'm almost reaching the end of this video here. Okay, so we're all done. So it looks like I did try to present the items at least twice. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, once again, that's, uh, that right there is an example of a, um, you know, multiple, uh, uh, Stimulus with replacement procedure. Um, it is a procedure that's very common in our field, and I, I hope that uh, you were able to find once again this this video, um, you know, useful. Sorry about that <laughs> commercial. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Once again, uh, thank you all for watching uh, here ABA with Dr. D. Uh, I hope to post a, a new video very soon. If you haven't done so, don't forget to uh, make sure to give us a. Uh, uh, subscribe there um, also hit that notification bell because we do post videos sometimes when you're in the field so you don't know when that happens so getting those notification bells help getting those prompts for you and uh yeah i hope to see you all soon take care now